Newton's first law of motion. There's two other laws of motion, but Newton has other laws, like law of universal gravitation, uh, laws with fluid dynamics and viscosity, uh, Newton's law of cooling, and Newton's method uh, in calculus. But um, today we're just going to focus in on Newton's first law of motion. It has to do with inertia, which was not discovered by Newton. It was discovered or identified by Galileo, refined by René Descartes, and then formalized by Newton as a law of motion. And I think students tend to be a little familiar with Newton's three laws of motion. Probably if I were to say an object will continue, I bet most students would be able to say in its present state of motion unless act upon by an unbalanced external force or something similar to that. And today we're only going to do Newton's first law, but let's look, just briefly look at Newton's second law. I think if I were to say force equals, that might be uh, hopefully enough to get you thinking about it, uh, but it equals mass times acceleration. Maybe you knew that. And then Newton's third law, if I were to say for every action, I bet you could finish that and say there is an equal and opposite reaction, opposite and equal reaction. Okay, so those are Newton's three laws. We're going to spend time on each of those. Before we do that, I think it's going to be important just to kind of make sure that we are solid with all these terms and the relationship between those terms. There's not a real good place to throw this in, but uh, maybe it fits here with Newton's laws. So we got to talk about what exactly mass is, weight, volume, density, and specific gravity. You might be familiar with those four, but that's maybe one you're not so familiar with. So mass, this is fairly basic, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. Mass is the quantity of how much matter there is. Okay, and how much material uh, there is that makes up that substance. And you would use it on a scale like this. One thing about mass is that it's always measured by comparing it to a known amount of mass. You put an unknown here, and then you slide these masses back and forth here, comparing your unknown mass to a known amount of mass. Mass is always measured by comparison. The units of it would be kilograms. And that is a fundamental unit uh, in the MKS system. K stands for kilograms. Weight is how much force gravity puts on that matter. It's how strong the, the gravitational pull is on that matter. And a scale like this, even though it says kilograms there, it's really not measuring mass. It's measuring the force, and force is measured in newtons. The reason this scale probably doesn't measure mass is that there's an internal spring. Anytime a scale has an internal spring in it, it's measuring the force of gravity, the weight of the object, because that spring gets compressed due to the force or the weight um, of the thing that's in that pan there. So if I had a one kilogram mass, that's referring to its mass, but if I hang that from a scale that has a spring in it, and it turns around here like this, that would be the, this scale would measure the weight of the object. And one kilogram of mass weighs 9.8 newtons. Now we did see that 9.8 when we were talking about the acceleration of gravity. And yes, they are related, but I'm gonna save that explanation until we talk about Newton's second law. So if I had one kilogram of mass and I took that kilogram of mass to the moon, I'm taking all that matter from Earth to the moon, so I should have the same quantity of matter. I should have one kilogram. So that's mass. But if I weighed it on Earth, it would weigh about 9.8 newtons. If I weighed it on the moon, it would only weigh about one-sixth of that, about 1 1.6 newtons. The moon is smaller, has less gravity, doesn't weigh as much. But that is referred to its weight. If I had took this scale and I put one kilogram on that scale and slid those things back and forth, it would balance out at one kilogram. But if I took that scale and this kilogram to the moon, 
even though the moon has less gravity, I slide these things back and forth, it would still balance out at the same place as it did here on Earth. This scale would still tell me it weighed one kilogram. And that's because even though the gravitational pull is less on the moon, it's pulling less on these masses and less on, those ma on that mass, and it would balance out at the same place. Put it on a scale with a spring in it, and it would read different. All right, now volume. Volume just the size or the space that it takes up. You could measure it in milliliters, you could measure it in cups or ounces, but if we're gonna do it in the MKS system, we would measure volume in cubic meters. It'd be a dimension of length, width, and height. And just an example you may have seen on cereal boxes, this package is sold by weight, not volume. What does that mean? That means if you open up the package and it see that it's only three-fourths the way full, you think you got gypped, but no, they sold it to you by a certain weight, um, not the volume. So they filled it up until it reached uh, 1.2 or one pound two ounces, not until it reached the top. Just a little disclaimer for them. Okay, density. Density, and you may be familiar with this, you may not, it's okay but it is the ratio of how much mass there is of an object to that volume of that object. Uh, we say density is mass divided by volume. And if we were to try to abbreviate this, M would be a good letter to abbreviate mass. Uh, capital V would be a good letter to abbreviate volume. Um, the reason is a capital is a, a lowercase v is for velocity. So those two make sense. But boy, D could stand for uh, distance. It, there's a number of different things it could stand for. It's just become tradition to use the Greek letter rho. It looks like a P, but it starts at the bottom here and curls around like this. The Greek letter rho is the abbreviation for density. And the units, the fundamental units, it's another way of saying the fundamental units uh, is MKS. Mass is measured in kilograms, volume is measured in cubic meters, so the fundamental units of density would be kilograms per cubic meter. Hopefully that's not too new of an idea for you. But in this example, these are little samples of material, zinc, lead, aluminum, tin, and copper. All of these are manufactured to have the same mass. They have different volumes, and because they have the same diameter, the volume is directly proportional to its length. So if we look at lead here, and it takes about two, three, four pieces of lead to make about the same volume of aluminum. So that says that the volume of aluminum is about four times the volume of lead. So the density of aluminum is about one fourth the density of lead. That's because these have the same mass. And the density of aluminum is about 2,700 kilograms per cubic meter uh, for aluminum, and the density of lead is about 11,300 kilograms per cubic meter. So if we had a loaf of Wonder Bread here, and we squeeze it down with our hands, uh, we could just test our understanding of density by asking which quantity decreased, and that was its volume. Which quantity increased, got more dense, and which quantity remained the same? It's mass. Okay, density seems pretty easy, but there's different kinds of density. Uh, we have a mass density, and a mass density is the ratio of mass to volume. That's just what we were talking about. And kilograms per cubic meter. But we also have a weight density. That's the ratio of how much the object weighs to its volume. And if from before, one kilogram of mass weighed 9.8 newtons, so you can convert mass into weight by just multiplying by the acceleration of gravity. So this would be the weight of the object divided by its volume. It'd be newtons per cubic meter. All right, so just weight density or mass density versus weight density. Now specific gravity, what the heck is that? Someone thought it was a good idea to make a, a, a variation on this, but it, it is useful sometimes. But um, specific gravity is the ratio of the weight of this of a material 
to the weight of an equal volume of water. So it's just comparing the weight of an object to the weight of an equal volume of water. So the specific gravity of, of some material, we'll call it x, would be the mass times gravity, that'd be the weight of that material, to the weight of water. And weight is density times volume. So this is the weight, density times volume, density times volume, but they had an equal volume. So it cancels out and uh, we can calculate the specific gravity of a material by just taking the density of that material divided by the density of water. And th they call it specific gravity because it has to do with the weight of the material. The specific gravity of, al of aluminum is 2.7. And, and notice that whatever units this has and whatever units those have will have the same units. So they'll cancel out so that specific gravity has no units. This is the density of water. And that would make the, the density of aluminum that. You just have to multiply by uh, the density of water by the specific gravity. So to find the density of your material, take the density of water, you're gonna put it over here, and multiply by the specific gravity of that material. All right, now we're ready to talk about inertia a little bit. An object's, this inertia is an object's resistance to changes in motion. And that phrase, changes in motion, can be substitute with, substituted with one word. And that word is acceleration. Inertia is a property of matter that matter will resist accelerating. Okay, And the amount of inertia an object has is directly proportional to how much mass it has. A four kilogram mass would have four times as much inertia as a one kilogram mass. And inertia, its resistance to motion, is a property of mass. We often call that property inertial mass. So simple question, which ball uh, would hurt more if kicked, soccer ball or uh, bowling ball? And hardness has a little bit to do with it, uh, but let's take hardness as, as out of the equation. Maybe we wrap each of these in a pillow and you know clearly that one's going to be harder even if wrapped in a pillow and that's because that has more mass, it has more inertia, it resists accelerating more than this and that resistance to acceleration we call ouch if you kick it at least. All right so more mass, more inertia. There's a demonstration you can do with these little PVC pipes with caps on the end. And you can take a rubber mallet and whack that thing and see it fly. And then whack this one and it really flies. And that's because this one would be filled with concrete and that one would be just filled with air. Much more mass, much more inertia, much more resistance to acceleration. All right. We, we've talked earlier that if we drop a feather and a hammer in a vacuum so that it's freely falling, both would fall at the exact same rate. And I think you've come to accept that fact and that on Earth, the rate at which they fall is 9.8 meters per second squared. You might accept that that's true, but why is it true? It still seems counterintuitive. So, this was the uh, Commander Scott on the moon dropping a feather and a hammer. But let me see if I can lead you to the right conclusion here by asking you a series of questions. Which of these two objects has more mass? Well, the hammer is going to have more mass. There's a lot more material in that hammer. Uh, which of these two objects would have more inertia? Well, the hammer, because the more mass it has, the more inertia it has. Those two things are directly proportional. Okay, but now, which object is going to have a greater resistance to acceleration? I often have students uh, say that the feather is the right answer there, but it's still the hammer. Because the first question was which one had more inertia. This question says which one has more inertia? Because inertia is 
a resistance to acceleration. All right, one more question here. Which one has a greater force of gravity acting on it? And people might say it has that these have the same force of gravity, but that's not true. They would have the same acceleration of gravity. But this one is this question is just asking which one weighs more? And the hammer is going to weigh more. Finally, uh, which one would have a greater acceleration when dropped in a vacuum? And they both accelerate at the same rate. Can you see how that explains why they fall at the same rate? No, maybe not. What if I circle these two things? The hammer had more resistance to acceleration, but it also had a greater amount of force acting on it. This one has more force acting on it, but it also has more inertia. So gravity is not pulling on that very hard, but it's not resisting that pull very much. And it's the ratio of how much pull of gravity is on it to how much inertia it has that, that determines how fast it accelerates. All right, I think we're ready now to formalize inertia into a law of motion, Newton's first law of motion. And we've already said it at the beginning, but an object will continue in its present state of motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced external force. And that present state of motion means it's not accelerating. An object will continue not accelerating unless acted upon by an unbalanced external force. Meaning, or you, you might remember that acceleration was not just going faster, but it was also going slower and it was also turning. So an object will resist turning, it will resist going faster, it will resist going slower, and it will continue doing that unless an unbalanced force, like five newtons in one direction and 10 newtons in the other direction, that'd be unbalanced. And it was an external force, something acting on the object. So if you're in an airplane flying 500 miles per hour and you hold a ball, you got to be super careful not to throw that ball in the air because if you throw it up in the air, it's going to whack the back of the airplane at 500 miles per hour. In fact, even if you like jump off the ground, you'll go flying backwards at 500 miles per hour. Oh, maybe that's not true. It's not true because 500 miles per hour is its present state of motion. And if you just jump up and come straight down, you're going to keep going at 500 miles per hour you don't have to worry about smacking the back of the plane. So you can just throw the ball straight up and it will come straight back down. If an astronaut is holding a ball and they throw the ball at 10 miles per hour, that ball is gonna go forever and ever and ever and ever at 10 miles per hour in a straight line, unless there's a force that changes its motion, like gravity, something like that. Okay, so this was an earthquake, and this was a, an over uh, an elevated bridge, and the question is, is which direction did the earth suddenly jolt? And it's laying off here to the left, but the earth jolted to the right. Here's our overhead bridge, and it has a lot of inertia. The ground jolted that way, and it tried to stay where it was at. The bottom got taken out from underneath it. And I don't think this person was heading to the lake trying to get their boat uh, in the water by putting it on top of their car. I think the boat was on the trailer. Car suddenly stopped. Boat kept on going until it encountered enough force to bring it to a stop. This is the most frustrating thing for kids. And I think you already know what I'm talking about here. That if you, uh, you're Steve or Susie or something, and your name begins with an S here, and you're sitting on this side, and you want to whirl your bowl around to bring it over here, you give it a whirl, and it stays right there. But if you keep going, there's enough friction that will get it going, and right when that thing gets here, you stop the bowl, but we forget that inertia wants to keep it going, and that friction will slow it down eventually. But... Um, Boy, that's a tough thing for little kids. And um, this would be a form of what's called rotational inertia. And a lot more coming on that later as well. If you've seen these little balls that when they bounce, they light up. 
um, they flash when they hit the ground. But this right here is called an inertial switch. That post is firmly attached to the circuit board and that spring, um, when the ball stopped, the spring would keep moving and hit that little post, um, completing a circuit, turning the switch on. Uh, seat belts. A lot of seat belts use an inertial wheel to uh, lock down the seat belt. So if this is the seat belt and this mechanism is under the seat, a uh, little uh, cog and gears, this little mass here pivots here and it's attached to a plate here. So if the car is stopped, so is that little mass, and the car accelerates forward, that mass wants to stay where it's at. And what it does is that little lever angles up here and locks it in place so the seatbelt can't unravel. If you are going and then you suddenly come to a stop, that mass wants to keep on moving and it locks it in place as well. And if you are uh, stopped and you begin moving backwards suddenly, same thing. Any motion will make that lock into place. Uh, any changes in motion, I should say, would make that lock into place. Cars used to be very, very unsafe. A uh, number of things, but um, the one thing I want to point out to you is that this car does not have headrests. And you think, headrests, why are those so important? Well, if you're in a car, stopped at the stoplight, and a car rear-ends into you and pushes you forward, if your seat only comes up to your shoulders, it's pushing your body forward. And where does your head go? Well, you might say your head goes backwards, but we're having to change our perspective a little bit. Your body was pushed forward and your head, because of its inertia, wants to stay where it's at. And that's going to create all sorts of ligaments that are compressed here, stretched here. Really bad news. So if you have headrests, make sure they stay in there. They're trying to push your head forward with your body. And it's amazing how, you know, things that seem obvious took a while to figure out. It used to be that race cars had these five-point harnesses that would just strap your body down into the seat, but um, nothing was like holding your head in place. So the Hans device is designed to kind of keep your head on your shoulders. So if your body is being violently whipped around, it will keep your, your head going with it. And, you know, if you're in a car here and you're going to bowling class or you're coming back from the, the job site or something, be careful about leaving big massive things like this on your seat. Because if you're in an accident and the car does all this crazy stuff like this, these rollover and stuff, that's inertia is going to want to keep it where it's at. And you could get seriously hurt um, if that hits you. Here's an example of someone coming back from the store with a five gallon bucket of paint. They were in an accident and boy, that paint kept on moving until it encountered something to slow them down. And uh, I don't know if, I don't think they were hurt, but you just have to just, well, you just have to laugh. There's, there's, I don't know if there's anything else you can do. All right, if you're in your car and you're going in a straight line at a constant velocity, that is your present state of motion. You know, if you're going 60 miles per hour, that's it. If you speed up, your inertia wants you to keep you going 60 miles per hour. If you slow down, your inertia is going to try to keep you going 60 miles per hour. If you turn, though, remember turning is a change in your motion. So your inertia wants to take you in a straight line like that. Your inertia will resist changes in motion. So if the car veers off to the right here, your inertia wants to take you straight. That's why you feel like you're being pressed up against that door, but it's really your inertia taking you straight. And that's all I have for inertia. Just a couple examples to hopefully make sense.